And the title of the message is, and we'll begin right here, Patience Vexed by Technology. Now remember, our text is in Hebrews 10, verse 36, for you have need of what? You have need of patience. So anything that ruins your patience, causes you to be impatient, tempts you to be, is a very, very dangerous. Last week we looked at how urbanization and the lack of direct experience with nature is taking its toll on the patience of many, ruining a whole generation of children. This week, we're going to examine how technology, primarily computer, internet, TV, that's what I mean by technology. We're going to take a look at how technology is likewise hindering patience and deforming the youth. Dear Father, I do pray that you'll be with our study. Lord, I do pray that you help us know where to divide, where to cut off, what to keep. Let us be discerning and honest about our own lives, that we be not deceived, but that we find the fullness of your blessings. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, for years, we've warned against video technology in regard to children. On the basis of not only the godless immorality present, you know, that's a big question right there. What are you going to find? What are you going to find that's wholesome? And um, I understand there are some things out there that are wholesome. But a lot of it, most of it's trash. And what happens is once your children are addicted to it, you have to feed that addiction. Because you haven't trained them to be quiet. You haven't learned to relate in any other way. So you've trained them to basically be addicted to this video technology. And now you have to supply more and more video to feed their addiction. And you're going to run out real quick. You're going to run out real quick. But this has never been, I mean, I certainly hit upon this quite often, but my contention in regard to video technology for children is that our forefathers, achieve great things without it. They learned how to read. They learned how to do great. You'll never get further than Bach, I believe, uh, uh, as far as instrumentation. Look at the King James Bible translators. Look at some of the great literature. Look at all these things that God has done for us in, in these earlier generations. They all achieved it without video technology, and I don't trust it. That's what I said from the very beginning. I do not trust it. Then I read other books and commentators that warn against it. So for many years, I have been warning that video technology for developing children, their minds, their brains that are developing, it hinders their learning. It hinders their language. Everything that they tell you about these schools wanting all this money for computers so we can increase the learning, it's all a lie. It's all built upon a myth. It's not going to increase the learning of your children. It's going to hinder their ability to read a book. It's going to hinder their ability to think, to speak. It's going to hinder their cognitive development. Now, numerous pediatricians and psychologists around the world are now agreeing. And they're issuing their own warnings. Pleading with folks. Don't put your child before a television. Don't put them before a video, a DVD player. But some of you think you're so smart. And I'm talking to Christianity at large right now. Some think they're so smart 
Well, I don't follow Joey and everything. So, well, go ahead and curse your children. You understand that? Your children are going to be cursed. You're going to hit. You say, well, I did pretty good. Did you really? That's my question. Did you really do pretty good? I don't think you did. I think video was a curse to you. Just throwing that out. Before we take a look at several ways in which technology in general is deforming this generation, it would be irresponsible not to begin with how it has made provision for the horrible sins of pornography, addiction. You know, I'd hate to come here and talk about language development and the fact that children aren't able to think rationally. I would hate to come here. I would just feel like I'm irresponsible to not mention that Forget for a second their language development. Forget for a second you're opening the door for pornography addiction to a child. Yet how many Christian parents give their children cell phones that they might look up anything, basically have access to pornography? How many of them give them computers in their room? How many of them give them, well, do your homeschool, little Johnny, now you get it done. And he says they're suffer, uh, surfing the Internet. You say, oh, we know how. we got a little block on here. He knows how to delete all that. He's smarter than you are. And half the time you don't even search to make sure. It's just a very wicked, damnable thing that's happening across this nation. And these children are suffering. And Christians who should know better are silent. Preachers are silent about it. ABC News, May 8, 2012, Generation Triple X. Is the Internet driving pornography addiction among school-age kids? A University of New Hampshire study reports exposure begins young, for some as young as 8 years old. It's available on our smartphones and tablets or at the click of a mouse. Saldivar and Hogg now work with a group called Fight the New Drug. The more chemicals released, they say, the more you want. Your brain starts needing even raunchier images. That's why many have argued, you think pornography is manly. Let me tell you something. It turns you into a sodomite. Do you understand that? It turns you into a wicked sodomite. That's what it does. Or a pedophile. Or something worse. You have to get more and more of your drugs. These children begin to withdraw from people. They begin to wear the hypocritical mask. The sin leads to lying, obviously. It leads to depression, suicide. All because fathers will not protect. You'll you'll protect them from a rapist, won't you? Why don't you protect them from a bunch of pornographers out here that want them to have access so they can raise up a generation already addicted? Yeah, it's getting uncomfortable in here. CBS, March 11, 2010, says 42% of Internet users aged 10 to 17 surveyed said they had seen online pornography in a recent 12-month span. CBS, March 11. Why don't some of these parents go to their children? Maybe they'll be honest. Sometimes the parents want, uh, sometimes the children want to confess. Why don't you go say, you know, I've given you access to a stinking cell phone and all these other iPad mess. I've given you access to a computer. Son, have you ever seen? You might get an honest answer. You just might. But even if you don't get an honest answer, don't you dare for a second assume that a child left to himself is not going to bring mama to shame. Actually, numerous books and articles claim that 90% of children ages 8 through 16 have viewed pornography online. In other words, most of the children in America have already viewed it. Instead of waiting in patience for marriage, these young people are robbing, cheapening, scarring, and perverting their precious lives. Yes, sir. I just was going to say that 90% of children, that's amazing because they wouldn't even define pornography the same way we would. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? 
And this is something that's sad of all, Brother Mike, is these are secular people concerned. They don't even have our standards. Professor Frank Partnoy has written that technology drives us to follow our short-term animal instincts. It certainly made provision for the flesh, and mankind has used it to become like the brute beast of Jude, how the Bible says they will be sensual like brute beasts in the last days. And the Holy Bible warns us, this is God, Jesus says this, that whatever cannot be controlled had better be what? Cut off. Now, if Jesus said your own eye or your own hand, how much more did Jesus mean your computer, your cell phone? Matthew 18, verse 8. You say, what do you think I ought to do, preacher? I'll tell you what I think you ought to do about technology. Do not tempt your children with it. I believe you ought to eradicate it from your house. And go back to traditional, old-fashioned ways of learning. And in regard to your own life, if anything cannot be handled, it ought to be cut off and thrown out. Hey, listen. You say you have an internet porn blocker on your computer. Do you know how to turn it off? Maybe you don't even care if your wife looks and sees it. Maybe you've got disgusting things going on right here in your own house. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you clearly right now. It'll be basically shown before the whole congregation. If you think God's just sitting back allowing your wicked addiction to continue, you're wrong. Why destroy your marriage? Why come in here and have to be all guilty and... And play the hypocrite. If you can't handle it, admit you can't handle it. And I don't know many that can. If you can't walk around with the ability to surf the internet and look at porn, then throw the stuff in the trash, be a man, learn how to manage your life. Second Peter 2 says, having eyes full of adultery. Wow, that's serious, isn't it? Are your eyes full of adultery every day? And cannot cease from sin. Why? Because they have an addiction. The Lord can break it, but they have an addiction, don't they? Beguiling, unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practice. The wife's not good enough. They need more. Cursed children. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It'd be better for you not to have heard the way of righteousness. It'd been better for you to never know about the kingdom and all the wonderful motivations and how to be holy than to have this light and still walk in this wicked sin. Why don't you save your children? Amen? Why don't you quit justifying the flesh? Why don't you quit justifying things? Why don't your wife, why don't you be God? Godly toward her and let her know she can trust you. Amen? We ought to pause here and admit that there are many types of technology. And we don't deny that some of it can be used for much good. Hey, Paul said even those things that are lawful, if they have power over me, if they ruin my testimony, cut them off as well. There are some things that's obvious ought to be cut off. New technology, it is true, is often rashly attacked. The working man's friend in 1833 says, False is a name, memorial alike, memorable alike in truth or fable. Marlowe and Goethe in undying verse have immortalized their hero, but the false of history is no less famous. Maybe this is my great, 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 great grandpa. With John Gutenberg, did Faust, an eminent and enterprising citizen of Mintz, Germany, associate himself as partner in the first printing press? Why am I giving you this? Because tonight I'm going to be very, very hard on technology, and I want to show you that a distant, 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 relative knows what it's like to have new technology and be demonized. 
his own energies and resources, immediately rendered it famous throughout the world. John Faust amassed considerable wealth. For some years, Faust and Gutenberg labored together. Though not the inventors, they stamped this art with a utility that rendered it universal. John Faust printed the first Bibles on the printing press. It was, in many senses, a fearful innovation. Our false wielded a power which shook the conventional world to its foundations. Gradually, the admiration of the public yielded to a sort of superstitious wonder, then to fear, to hate. Many, too, were personally interested in denouncing the new art. Fanaticism and ignorance set earnestly to work. Foss had introduced colored inks. In many of his books, the red hue predominated. Little further proof was required by his enemies. For here was displayed the very signs by which he had contracted his compact with the evil one. His house was invaded. His presses were destroyed. His business suspended. Foss lived to witness many of the mighty effects of the science which he had so materially promoted. He was undoubtedly a man of energy, a master spirit in his time. The country gentleman of 1854 says a man named John Foss became associated with Gutenberg, did much to improve the art the latter had invented. In 1462, Foss went to Paris to sell the Bibles he had printed. When the monks, fearing his business would so interfere with their plans as to render their copying labors unnecessary, opposed him bitterly and appealed to the prejudices and superstitions of the people by declaring that he was leagued with the father of lies. Hence arose the tradition that Satan mysteriously conducted the printer to his invisible kingdom. Faust invented printing ink, and Gutenberg constructed a rude printing press. Printing was regarded with marked suspicion by the power of even cultivated England. But the men who came to the shores of New England in the Mayflower had more enlarged ideas of the power and usefulness of printing. And it seems, as I read down through the ages... Uh, the false continued, South Carolina, all the official legislation was printed by false printers. They seemed to stay in the printing industry. The Art Union of 1841 says the red ink you go The red ink used in the printing was said to be his blood, as an article of his compact with Satan without whose aid it was decided he could not have executed so stupendous and so extraordinary a work, hence most probably the German story of Faustus. I do want to set one thing straight. I do have some copies up here of Fox's Book of Martyrs, the 1576 revised edition, going back to somebody that was pretty much close, or at least closer to the original invention of the printing press. Uh, Fox in his 1576 revised edition, says the first inventor of the printing press, as most agree, is thought to be a German named John Faustus, a goldsmith. The occasion of this invention first was by engraving the letters of the alphabet in metal. The man being industrious and acute, perceiving that thought to proceed further and to see whether it would also frame as well in words and in whole sentences as it did in letters, which when he procured to come well to pass, when he perceived, I guess, to come well to pass, he made certain other counsel with John Gutenberg and Peter Shafford, binding them by oath to keep silence. After so many years, Gutenberg, co-partner with Foss, began then to broach the matter at Strasbourg, but all doubt God himself was the ordainer and disposer thereof. So basically how Gutenberg ended up getting the actual credit when he's the actual one that revealed it, uh, I don't know. But Fox's Book of Martyrs links it to John Faust, called it a marvelous gift from God. He was dragged to the stake to be burned as a sorcerer. Maybe that's where the whole idea of uh, selling his soul to the devil ended up. Now, as interesting as all that is, I want you to understand, I know God mightily, as John Fox has said, used that printing press. He put that King James Bible on that printing press and in later years, and it went all over the world. And... What an amazing thing God did when he published it. And so it's clear, therefore, 
that new technology can be unfairly attacked. So I wanted to give you that foundation that I understand. What they're telling me today is that the Internet, the computer, this is the new printing press. So it would be wrong to condemn it as satanic just as it would be wrong for them to condemn the printing press of Faust and Gutenberg satanic. But it is equally true that new technologies can be blindly accepted without any discrimination. Because some tools are useful. Jesus once used a ship for a pulpit. Does that mean that every new technology has a limitless divine endorsement? In other words, here's my question. People go back and they say, well, Wesley was, you know, they got on the Wesley. They got onto these early fellows for some of the songs they sang. And my question has always been, so does that basically give an unlimited divine endorsement that you can just keep anytime anybody uh, accuses something of being satanic? You have to say, well, that's what they said about Wesley. That's what they said about Moody. And it's the same thing with this. Because some people, mainly Catholics, wrongly declared something satanic that was not, does this mean then that God has given an endorsement to anything man wants to create as saying it's going to be of God. I mean, doesn't the Bible say they sought out inventions, wicked inventions? For what it's worth, we have in other sermons traced the history of the first computer to a man who once tried to sell his soul to the devil in a satanic ritual, Charles Babbage. We've also seen how Thomas Edison was a Luciferian, theosophist. Certainly these facts should give us some pause. I use a computer. But I do believe it's destroying our health. I do believe it's hurting our eyesight. I do everything I can to minimize and fix that. I try to use the tool. I know it has potential to ruin families, to destroy your family, destroy your soul. I know it's got the power to do that. I try to use it to whatever degree I can. But we have to all be honest. And where these things begin to hinder as weights our race that we're to run by the way with what? Patience. Wow. Then we need to cast it aside. Thomas Edison was a Luciferian theosophist. Certainly these facts should give us pause. But such patience is greatly lacking today. Nobody's pausing in anything to think. And ironically, many technology insiders believe that you don't have patience because of the new technologies. So the very thing that should cause you to stop and critically investigate and discern, we don't have this discernment, we don't have this ability to think critically, we don't even have this ability to stop and pause because of the new technology. Notice how many researchers and observers are warning, or at least admitting, that many of today's new technologies are hindering patients and many other virtues. I read quite a few books on this subject. And uh, Dave Shank wrote The End of Patience, Cautionary Notes on the Information Revolution. He says the truth is that technology can dramatically affect the way we behave. Actual news nuggets being reported are of little practical or intellectual value. We become like jumpy newsroom reporters. He goes into a reporter's office, and notice how stressed out and jumpy and, and, and how they are. He said, but that's how we've all become. We, we've all become this, looking for the next little tidbit of news, you know, and, and you're addicted, and you have to check it, and you have to look, and, and, and we think because we're reading these little headlines that somehow or another we are up to date and, and we are accomplishing something in life. And, and uh, in the marketbit.com, the headline says, Internet technology fuels our lack of patience. Interesting. We want things fast, really fast. We don't want to wait for websites to load or for service or for romance to blossom. In other words, we're carrying this out into our, our walk. Worse, if we're made to wait, we'll walk away never to return. If Amazon could potentially lose $1.6 billion 
Thanks to a one-second delay, you know speed has become our new God. Pew Internet, February 29th of this year, says Alvaro Retana, Retana, a distinguished technologist with Hewlett Packard, expressed concerns about humans' ability to tackle complex challenges. The short attention spans resulting from the quick interactions will be detrimental to focusing on the harder problems. Think about your children now. The people who will strive and lead the charge will be the ones able to disconnect themselves. Melissa Ashner, a student at the College of William and Mary, observed, People report having more difficulty with sustained attention, becoming immersed in a book. Today we have very young, impressionable minds depending on technology for many things. It's hard to predict the ways in which this starves young brains of cognitive ability. Dana Levin, a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, wrote, The biggest consequence I foresee is an expectation of immediacy and decreased patience among people. Those who grow up with immediate access to media, quick response to email, and rapid answers to all questions may be less likely to take longer routes to find information, seeking quick fixes, rather than taking the time to come to a conclusion or investigate an answer. It also hinders fellowship, you know. We're all probably guilty of it. But I tell the story of uh, riding in the car with young folks that didn't even look at me, took no advantage of the situation to ask questions, to speak to an older person, to hear my testimony, to hear what, what I had to say. I could have helped these young people in amazing ways, and many of you could as well. But there's no access to them because they're buried in their phone. Our fellowship. You're trying to have fellowship with somebody. And they're too busy looking at their phone to really have fellowship. They're fellowshipping with somebody who's not here and missing the fellowship of somebody that is here. And I'll show in a moment it's really become an addiction. You've really got a compulsive disorder. I use that word lightly. Richard Forno, a longtime cybersecurity expert, agreed with these younger respondents saying, my sense is that society is becoming conditioned into dependence on technology in ways that, if that technology suddenly disappears or breaks down, will render people functionally useless. Now, that's something to think about. What if it turns off? We don't have no sense of direction. We don't have a sense of time. We don't have a... We don't don't know how to read a book anymore. Well, now you've got to go look at encyclopedia, find out the hard way. You don't know how to do that. You don't know how to look at sources. You don't know how to write a paper. You don't know how to write a letter. Many anonymous respondents focus their responses on what one referred to as fast twitch wiring. Here's a collection of comments along those lines. I wonder if we will even be able to sustain attention on one thing for a few hours. I wonder that too. I thought TV was bad enough. Now people are walking around with their TVs. Their TVs are in their car. This is why. If you're going to have a meaningful sermon that's going to open up many books and digest them, and we're going to talk about these things and preach deep principles out of these books, who has the patience for that? Who has the attention span? See. They want bubblegum, pop sermons, little soundbite sermons, you know. Communication in all forms will be more direct, fewer of the niceties. You know, they took some time to greet people in letters in earlier days. They took some time to call one another by name and say some kind word. And, and, you know, we don't have that anymore in our culture in many places. Increasingly, teens and young adults rely on the first bit of information they find on a topic, assuming that they have found the right answer. You know, people say, well, I read about you, Mr. Foss. I said, you did? Yeah, I'm a good Google searcher. So so, so you find some adversary of mine who gives a fast little sound bite and you think you understand the whole subject and know everything about everything concerning the subject matter. Isn't that crazy? 
It's not just that with me. It's with anybody. It's with any subject. That's what research is today. I looked at Wikipedia, and there you go. Orlando? It's solid truth, and that's that. Brother Brett, you have something? Okay. Constant broadcasts don't make it easy for the individual to step away and work through an issue or concern without interruption. Another says, my friends are less interested in genuine human interaction than they are at looking at things on Facebook. Parents and kids will spend less time developing meaningful and bonded relationships in deference to the pursuit and processing of more and more segmented information competing for space in their heads. Quote, they're raised in a culture increasingly focused on instant gratification with as little effort as possible. What's that going to do to people? I have to have instant gratification. Well, really, we're becoming a giant gossip culture. We're, we're, we're being like the Athenians on steroids that live to hear and tell some new thing. Who needs original original research when you have Wikipedia, says another? Much of the communication and media consumed in an always-on environment is mind-numbing chatter. That's true, isn't it? Have you ever seen, well, it would be nice to get a whole bunch of Christians together, fundamental forum or whatever, and what did they end up doing, Brother Jeff? I mean, I couldn't believe I would try to come in there and just take a look to see some of the debates. And I thought you're going to have nice, intelligent discussions. And it was the most silly, ridiculous, absurd. I've never seen anything like it in all my life. You agree? Robert F. Lutz, director of Valley Housing and Economic Authority, says technology is taking humanity down a harmful path. We have, by and large created a feed-me, fix-me generation of soundbite learners. They're not given the skills to retain anything more than short bits of information. Stagnation of the whole population will come as a result of lack of the skills of innovation and deep thinking. Keith Davis, a team leader for U.S. Defense Department Knowledge Management Initiative, noted, quote, technology is taking more and more of our children's time, and not much of the Internet time is spent learning. Time once spent outside as a child is now spent on computers. Our children are becoming sedentary and overweight at an alarming rate. Weight gain and that type of lifestyle causes apathy in our children. Social skills will be lost, and a generation understand, a general understanding of common sense will be a thing of the past. Eugene Spafford, a professor of computer science and engineering at Purdue University, responded that many young adults are unable to function in a confident and direct manner without immediate access to online sources and social affirmation. Megan Ellinger, a user experience analysis for research organization based in Washington, D.C., noted that, quote, it is becoming more difficult to find truth. More difficult to find truth? I thought this was the information age. What a paradox. Now look at 2 Timothy 3 in light of everything we've read. Look at the prophecy of 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days, this is the time we're living in, perilous times shall come. Why? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And what are they? Covetous. They don't call the television the covetous box for no reason. Covetous. And look at three, incontinent. They can't control themselves. They can't wait. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. Look at verse 7. Ever learning. But what does it say? Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Does that sound like our age? Always researching, always looking, always searching, always looking at some new site, always downloading, always watching, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do they think they're smart? Do they think they're informed? You better believe it. But many of the foundational truths continue to escape this generation. Truths about the family, truths about the Bible, truths about the church, truth about the fear of God. All of these important foundational truths escaping this generation. But they're ever learning. New York Times in 2010 set an ugly toll of technology, impatience, and forgetfulness. Are your Facebook friends more interesting than those you have in real life? 
Exposure to technology may be slowly reshaping your personality. You're becoming more impatient, impulsive, forgetful, and even more narcissistic, which means full of self-love. What did it say here in 2 Timothy? The first thing, there will be lovers of their own selves. This is amazing, isn't it? December 4th, Health Day News. Can an obsession with your cell phone rise to the level of addiction? Two researchers who headed a recent study think so. Study co-author James Roberts, a professor of marketing at Baylor. That's particularly true when we use them excessively in public because when we do so, we're signaling that we've got this shiny object, this status symbol, our iPhone or Android or BlackBerry, and that we've got important people to talk to or text who are maybe even more important than the people right in front of us. And that we're so important that we have to talk everywhere and all the time in front of others. And all of that is an expression of materialism. Studies show how young adults check their phones an average of 60 times per day. You know... There are times when you do have important things to do. But what happened to the grace and courtesy to say, you know what, will you excuse me a second? And, and I'm sure it's so common people will excuse you, but at least let's have the grace to say, I need to stop for a second this conversation and I feel bad about this, but if you'll excuse me for a second. But people don't do that anymore. They're not even looking. They're looking right at you, but they're talking on their phones. They're somewhere. They can't have a conversation. They're too busy checking their text, checking this, checking that, little wires hanging from their head and stuff. And I know that can be convenient, but I'm telling you, we need to start thinking critically about how it's affecting your life with your family with your church members. Washington, D.C., I-A-N-S-R-I-A, says cell phones. Americans can't seem to live without them or even with them. According to some recent studies that looked at the growing trend of cell phone addiction in the U.S. and the impact compulsive use has on relationships. Another recently released study published in Journal of Behavioral Addictions found constantly checking for messages can ruin personal relationships. Researchers there liken compulsive cell phone usage to other addictions, including drugs and alcohol. Notice 3 John 1 in relation to all of this. I had many things to write, says John, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. It takes some time to write with ink and pen, you know. And I believe that when he wrote with ink and pen, it was very proper. He had good greetings. He had good introductions. He said what he did. He took some time with ink and pen to write. But listen to what he says. I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. That, to me, sounds like John is saying, in some ways... We have the Scripture, and it can go down through the ages. It's not bound by the physical body. And praise God for the Holy Bible. But he's saying here that unless it's inspired Scripture, um, there is something very, very useful about face-to-face speaking, which is why many have seen that I prefer face-to-face speaking. I want to see your eyes. I want to see your face. I want you to see my eyes. I want you to see my face. I know sometimes just we can communicate in sound bites, but if it's a serious issue or even a halfway serious issue or something, that how much better is it to meet face-to-face? I still believe in personal face-to-face contact. Uh, that might be out of, might be old-fashioned. I still believe in it. And I still want to utilize it in this church. Amen? I'm not surrendering to this little soundbite internet age. I just, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to use it to whatever degree I can, but we need to do everything we can to keep it from hindering life. Amen? Listen to this. Personal.psu.edu, March 21st, 2010. Negative effects of technology on children. Oh, this is what really gets me bad. According to a New York Times article this January, now this was back in 2010. I'm sure it's worse now, almost 2013. 
But three years ago, according to a New York Times article this January, the average kid ages 8 to 18 spends over seven and a half hours a day using technology gadgets, equaling two and a half hours of music, five hours of TV and movies, three hours of Internet and video games, and just 38 minutes of old-fashioned reading, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, which adds up to 75 hours a week. Their brain is jello. Not to mention the physical radiation upon your body. I mean, your, your brain, no wonder they can't even read, no wonder they can't even write a paragraph or read a paragraph. It's why they come in here and get nervous and sit down and, and you ask them, well, you sat there for an hour, what did the preacher preach upon? I don't know. I don't know. These statistics are not just mere numbers. They are a reflection of the way our society is heading. There's a direct correlation of amount of hours spent with gadgets and obesity, poor grades, impatience, violence, and a loss of family interest. They don't care about dad anymore. They used to want dad to come home so they can be around him. I don't care about dad. Impatient goes hand in hand with the laziness kids are starting to develop. Due to the ease of access to the Internet, kids now expect immediate responses and rely on the Internet to give them all of the answers. They expect answers before they take time to think about solutions. You know, I might ask a question here. What's this doing with our relationship to God? God doesn't always give you immediate answers. So what are we going to do here? What are we going to do there? What, I don't know. You don't have answers? No. Well, 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 what do you mean you don't have answers? Well, I'm trusting God. God's never failed me. God, God's always here for us. I'm going to do my best to plan, but some things we just don't know. It's called faith. And you better learn it. Amen? You better learn it quick. You better learn to find out real quick God doesn't jump when you say jump. God doesn't always show up. God, I need an answer. He says, I'll give you wisdom. I'll braid it not. But it's going to be on His schedule, His time. And the more we get around God, that's the more we're going to walk in the same way. And that's hard for this jumping Internet generation to deal with, isn't it? They expect answers before they take time to think about solutions. According to an article in New York Times this January, new technology is creating many generation gaps and are most visible in communication and entertainment choices. Dr. Rosen said that the newest generations, unlike their old peers, will expect an instant response from everyone they communicate with. They won't have the patience for anything less. They'll want their teachers and professors and pastors to respond to them immediately. And we ought to do what we can. Amen. We ought to do what we can. They will expect instantaneous access to everyone because, after all, this is the experience they have grown, had growing up. Families are being hurt as well by all this new technology. When a group of four to six-year-olds were asked to choose between watching TV and spending quality time with their fathers, 54% of them would rather watch TV. Also, according to the same survey reported by the A.C. Nielsen Company, the average parent spends three and a half minutes a week having meaningful conversations with their children. Isn't that nice of them? I can't believe they found three and a half minutes to not check a text message or have something doodling from their head or, or be downloading something. Isn't that nice? They had three and a half minutes to have a meaningful conversation. Technology is creating a generation gap that makes parents feel as though they can't relate to what their kids are doing. Now read Malachi 4. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What has happened in the last days? There is a generation gap. The hearts of the children aren't to the fathers, and the fathers aren't to the children. Well, what are they doing? They're looking at their cell phones. What did you think they're doing? And meaningful play is gone now. Or, or I, I, I even phrased that wrong. How about just play? How about a time to, to, to just be a child and go outside? What if you told your children, go outside and play? What are you talking about? The piano lesson time? No. 
Is somebody organizing a sport? No. Go outside in the yard and play. It's a foreign concept today, isn't it? You mean I've got to make up something out in the yard to do? Zechariah 8 says, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls. What are they doing? Playing in the streets thereof. Playing. The millennial kingdom. Do you want to get in it? I do. You know what the millennial kingdom is going to be filled with? A bunch of kids playing. If you don't like that, you're not going to like the kingdom. Now, there's a time for work, amen? Time for doing your work, time for all of this. But there's a time for play. Holy play, good play, wholesome play. Children, learn how to play. Learn how to play outside. Last Child in the Woods, which we quoted last week, look at it from a technology perspective. It says, I like to play indoors better because that's where all the electrical outlets are, said the fourth grader in San Diego. The writer says, in many classrooms, I had variations on that statement. As to playing basketball and such like in the neighborhood, you now have community associations that will remind the residents that such activities violate the covenants they had signed. Indoors go the kids. Game Boy and Sega become their imagination. The kids are getting fat. Today, more than 57 million Americans live in homes ruled by condominium, cooperative, and homeowner associations. The untold consequence, you know, I believe... Missouri, you can't just have a kid shooting his gun over at the neighbor's house, something ridiculous like that. But you ought to be able to play, eh, man? You ought to be able to play. And there ought to be plenty of room for you to play, so you've got to play outside my window. Eh, man? But listen, playing is fun. Playing is good. But are children being allowed to play today? No, Hardly. Not long ago, the soundtrack of a young person's days and nights was composed largely of the notes of nature. Today, the life of the senses is literally electrified. Even windows are often no longer open. The information age is, in fact, a myth, as we've already found out. Because they're not really getting information, are they? Not real information. Even in cars, you now have rear seat and in-depth multimedia entertainment products. They're quickly becoming the hottest add-on. What's the target market? Parents who will pay a premium for a little backseat piece. The children can watch Sesame Street or play Grand Theft Auto without bothering the driver. Have you ever noticed? All the Sesame Street characters, if they're male, are very effeminate. And then you have this Elmo fella busted for all this uh, pedophilia and things. And there's a, sat- there's a sodomite spirit on Sesame Street. But... The, the problem is simply, the bigger problem is, is certainly the immoral trash they're watching. But the biggest problem is simply that parents now are using that as a crutch so they can have peace and drive. See, in, in my car, they're not allowed to talk in the back seat unless it's a very soft whisper. And that's how we do things. I can talk to my wife. I can think. I can drive. When we get into the car and I'm trapped in there with you, If I'm not talking to you directly, you have to be quiet. That's how I raised my family. So, but now instead of having that authority to keep their kids quiet, they use that DVD, don't they? Well, now your child's learning that unless I get my DVD drug, I'm not going to be quiet. And I'm not a very good DVD actor, so when they come in here and... I'm not a DVD. It's hard for them to understand, is it not? When we traveled as children, the landscape we watched was our drive-by movie. Remember those days? That's what you did. You looked out the window. What I see in America today is an almost religious zeal for the technological approach to every facet of life. It can become delusional. We're beginning to lose the ability to experience the world directly. Little is known about the impact of new technologies on children's emotional health. Well, if little is known, why is everybody diving into it? But we do know something about the implications for adults. People who spend even a few hours on the Internet each week suffer higher levels of depression and loneliness than those who refrain. We do know that. So if that's true of adults, then why not also be even more true in regard to children? So now they're, they're going to be depressed. They're going to be lonely to the degree that they surf the Internet. 
Fran Wilson, professor of neurology at Stanford University, says, We've been sold a bill of goods, especially parents, about how valuable computer-based experience is. These are the insiders that are supposed to, you know, know something about this. Something's missing. Yet many develop a wired, know-it-all state of mind. Children's Hospital and Regional Medical Center in Seattle maintains that each hour of TV watch per day by preschoolers increases by 10% the likelihood that they'll develop concentration problems and other symptoms of attention deficit disorder by age 7. You say, well, I'm interested to see how your experiment works, Brother Joey. No, you're doing the experiment, not me. I'm doing what they've always done. My children don't watch video. My children don't do all of these things. I don't give all these things to my children and say, go in your room, download whatever you want, look at whatever you want. I don't do that. The closest I've ever come to it is a controlled me standing there looking at a little furry animal on Wild Kingdom or something, rebuking whatever evolution someone has made. And then, well, I've only done that maybe a handful of times in all 13 years that my daughter's been alive. We spend time reading stories. I did it a few times, and they started saying, can we watch another? Can we watch another? And I said, forget it. I'm done with it. I'm not saying I'll never, ever let them see a sermon or something or a furry animal. On, but, but I don't hardly ever do that. Well, the, the computer's not in our home. That, that's not what we do. My children don't learn with a computer. They write. They read books. Wow, I'm interested in that experience. No, I'm interested in your experience. I'm interested in your experiment. Because I don't approve of it. And when all said and done, when your child can't read, don't you blame it on a whole bunch of other things. When your child's having speech problems, don't you blame it on a whole bunch of things. Let's just get right to the point. Let's get right to the point. Amen, preacher. It's good preaching. Nicholas Carr, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Sounds like a good book, huh? The writer says, I'm not thinking the way I used to think. I feel it most strongly when I'm reading. I get fidgety. You get fidgety when you read? The deep reading that used to come naturally has become a struggle. The net seems to be chipping away my capacity for concentration and contemplation. Bruce Feldman, a pathologist of the faculty of the University of Michigan Medical School, who blogs about the use of computers and medicine, says, I now have almost totally lost the ability to read and absorb a longish article on the web or in print. He can't even read on the Internet. Duke University professor Catherine Hales confessed, I can't get my students to read whole books anymore. The students she's talking about are students of English literature. The linear mind is being pushed aside by a new kind of mind. I miss my old brain. Our ways of thinking we now know are changed through the way we live. We become neurologically, neurologically what we think. It seems ludicrous to think that fiddling with a computer could alter in a deep and lasting way what was going on inside my head. But I was wrong. He goes and quotes, quotes all the neurological studies and latest science in regard to how even using the computer and looking at a screen functions different, causes different things to go off in the brain than reading a book. And when all is said and done, I tell you this, when everything's finished, they're going to find out that looking at that black and white Bible, it was king and was supreme. That's what they're going to find out. That's what they're going to find out. It is our intellectual technologies that have the greatest and most lasting power over what and how we think. Reading a book was a meditative act at one time, but it didn't involve a clearing of the mind. Foss was run out of town on suspicion of being in league with the devil. But in one fascinating study conducted at Washington's University Dynamic Cognition Laboratory, researchers used brain scans to examine people reading books. Deep reading says the study's lead researcher, is by no means a passive exercise. But TV is a passive exercise. However, after 550 years, 
The printing press and its products are being pushed from the center of our intellectual lives. The pathways in our brains are being rerouted. As net use has gone up, television viewer viewing has either held steady or increased. Most Americans, 2009, spend at least eight and a half hours a day looking at television, computer monitor, or the screen of their mobile phone. Book reading is declining. Not a bad book. Don't agree with everything, but uh, for these secular folks to come in and start observing these things, I appreciate it. We don't have time to review the following books. I've read them or most of them, but their titles alone are instructive to you. Here's one, Digital Vertigo, How Today's Online Social Revolution is Dividing, Diminishing, and Disorienting Us. Disorienting. It's certainly, I can see as a church. I, I tell you what, if there's one thing, you say, what would you do first if you just had power in America? Uh, put aside whether it would be right legally or constitutionally. But if I could just do one thing, one of the things I would do is disconnect Facebook. You say, why'd you do that, preacher? The same reason I got off of it. So why'd you do it? Because it's filled with a bunch of gossip. And not only that, it's connecting people that could never, ever be connected in, in the most amazing way. This carnal Christian with this carnal Christian from a long time ago connected to this person. How did he ever meet so-and-so? Somehow or another they hook up. Somehow or another they hooked up together. Only the devil could do that. Um, here's one eye disorder. Understanding our obsession with technology and overcoming its hold on us. Alone together. Why we expect more from technology and less from each other. So now the writer of this book is saying we're all lonely and alone since this Facebook generation. But now we're all lonely together. We're all depressed and lonely together. Likewise, notice the following headlines and excerpts. Here's one. Is social media to blame for the rise in narcissism? Over the last couple of years, a plethora of research has been pouring in that makes connections between Facebook and narcissism. Here's another one. Are the media creating a generation of narcissists? Here's another one. Social networks and the narcissism epidemic, CBS News. Here's another one. Facebook's dark side. Study finds link to socially aggressive narcissism. Here's another one. Study. Social media is for narcissists. Here's another one, how social media made us narcissists, life, ebony. Here's another one, is Facebook making us lonely? The Atlantic. Here's another one, the loneliness of social media. Here's another one, social media, no cure for loneliness, study says. Here's another one, social media and our epidemic of loneliness. Here's another one, lonely planet, social networking sites like Facebook and MySpace may provide people with a false sense of connection that ultimately increases loneliness. Multitudes of other headlines link social media to aggression, impatience, and everything else that's associated with selfishness. You better think carefully about how you're going to rule your house. Think these things out. Don't just let this world, all this stuff invade your house, and you're sitting back passive just watching this race this avalanche down the hill. You better think about what you bring in your house. And you better investigate it. And if it's of God and it's good and it can be used, use it. But you better be honest about it. Just not because you're chicken to stand up to your family. You understand that? And if you ask me about it, I'd say disconnect everybody that you know from Facebook. Do it right now. I'd say get rid of all this Internet connection for your children. Get rid of anything that has to do with it. And if you and your wife want to, in a sane, godly way, search the Internet, uh, uh, you do it in a way that you know that you're doing it in a holy, safe, structured environment. That's what I believe. The Bible said in Revelation 18, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Come out of her. <clears throat> Say, why you draw the line there? I've got to draw it somewhere. And I, I, I found my line. I'm not going further. I found it. I'm done with it. Not going any further. I use email, but I will not, in deal, I will, unless it's impossible for me to meet face to face, I will not use email for in depth conversations. If I have to, because there's no other way to meet, I'll use it. But email, 
maybe text messages every now and then for, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it here, whatever, things like that. Don't you send, don't, don't, don't text me something that deals with counseling or something. Don't, don't text me those types of things. Call me and we'll set up a meeting. Amen? All right. Now I'll turn it over to you, brethren. Questions, comments? 